Okay, so we're going to get started. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, today, we're, we're going to have a little experiment. We're going to do an experiment along, um, led by Nancy. Um, and so just a quick introduction of the voices you're going to hear. So um, I'm Kashfa. I'll be uh, doing the introduction and uh, asking your questions throughout the program. And then, of course, Nancy Lee is going to be leading our, our very exciting chromatography experiment. Um, so I hope that you'll join in. Um, and I'm just going to do a quick introduction to the museum. So I did want to start with the land acknowledgments. The Bidi Biodiversity Museum is on the traditional unceded and ancestral uh, territory of the Muscogee people. And I've included a link to the First Peoples map of BC. Um, if you'd like to see what uh, traditional territory uh, you are currently on. And here we are on a map. The museum is right here over at UBC. And we're really close to lots of other museums on campus as well. Pacific Museum of Earth, uh, the Museum of Anthropology, the Botanical Garden. Lots of wonderful places to visit when we are open, when it is safe to do so. This is what the museum is like on the outside. We've got this huge blue whale, uh, and uh, which is just one of over two million specimens at the museum, so lots of really cool things to see. And I'll briefly tell you about this building that's right next to the skeleton. Uh, that is the Biodiversity Research Center. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's where we have lots of biologists, lots of uh, people studying all aspects of biodiversity. Um, and this, this little poster shows the different kinds of organisms that are studied by people. And in the museum itself, we've got six different collections. We've got uh, tetrapods, birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians. We've got things from the oceans without a backbone in the marine invertebrates. The herbarium has plants and plant-like things, insects and their close relatives, fish and fossils. So lots of really cool things uh, to see. And today we're going to be doing an experiment with Nancy. So Nancy, I'm going to hand it over to you now. You're welcome okay. you share. Thank you. All right. So I'm just going to share my screen here. And what we're going to do is we're going to start with an experiment. Uh, if you haven't done this type of experiment before, I'm going to make it a surprise. I don't like spoilers when I go to the movie, so I'm not going to give you a spoiler here yet. Uh, and then we're going to talk about it. Uh, and then we're going to talk about different processes in science that use something kind of similar uh, to help us understand that. Uh, and we'll even talk a little bit about COVID-19 as well. Uh, but if you are uh, interested in just the experiment part, we're going to start with that first, and then you can see how long you want to hang in there. So I'm going to explain the materials a little bit in detail, but they're very, very simple. So this is your chance, if you don't have them yet, to go and grab anything you need or just go through a mental checklist of, the, of your materials that you have already gathered if you've done that. Okay, so I'm going to do this a little bit. And what I'm going to show you is that I have a short glass. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It could be any cup, but it's nice to have the glass so you can see through it and see what's happening. Um, and it doesn't really matter if you have a taller one because we can deal with that as well. Okay, so there's a glass. Now I put in just a tiny, tiny bit of water in there. I have a little bit more water there in case I want to do some more experiments, but there is just a little bit of water in the bottom. It doesn't matter exactly how much. Okay, so, uh, and the, the next thing that I've got is, uh, and you guys let me know if you can't see this very well, Kashfa, Nicole can let me know as well. Um, but I have a selection of pens that I found around my place and uh, they are all sorts of pens that are not permanent. So it doesn't really matter what kind as long as it isn't gonna be permanent. For example, this is a classic type of uh, felt uh, that you can use for crafts. Uh, also, I have these kind of um, felt pens that, that are like that. I have uh, the colors that I think are great to get, um, at least to start with, are black and brown. So any kind of black or brown felt is great. Um, these are, um, notice that this is all, like they're called washable markers, so we want them to uh, be dissolved in water. And then I have some more of those markers, but I have different colors of them as well. Okay, so I also have here um, a coffee filter. Um, and I have a paper towel. So it doesn't really matter which one. You probably won't even need the whole paper towel. So that's, that's it. And then I've got some scissors to help us cut it up. 
And I've also got a few other things that are useful, but if you don't have them, don't worry. Uh, we have a pencil, which will be good to label. And then we've got a ruler. And then we have a little bit of tape, but we can do this without tape as well. Okay, so really, really simple, which is why I love this experiment. And it's really, uh, we can do it multiple times too, because it is so simple. So we can try it over and over, or you can try it um, again after the, after the session today. Okay, so how is everyone doing? Feel free to try out the chat today. Um, ask your questions in there. Uh, tell us how it's going on. I'm gonna ask you to also, if you're comfortable, share your video screen uh, in a bit too to show, show what happened with yours. And um, yeah, so if, you, if, you, if you've got all that, let me know. Uh, you can put it in the chat or you can say, let me see if I can see the chat. Okay, great. All right, so we're going to go on. Hopefully people are going to join us in the experiment because this is really a wonderful thing that, you know, no matter where we are in the world, we can actually run the same experiment together, which is really neat um, about these virtual programs. Okay. All right. So I don't see anyone in the chat saying that they have their materials, but I know a couple of you do. Uh, and so we'll, we'll keep going. Uh, yeah, okay, there you go, there's a new one. Okay, fantastic. So we'll keep going and we'll go to the next slide. So I've just written this down just as a reminder to myself, but we're actually going to do this all together and I'm going to put, I'm going to put the camera down so that on, on my materials so that you can see what we're going to be doing. But the very simple things, we're just going to cut the paper and write it on and things like that. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing so you can see better and feel free to share your screens as well. We have so few that it might not be a problem today. Uh, in terms I will of share mine. Yes, my uh, that bandwidth, there you go. And so, okay, what we're gonna start with is have a little bit of water in your cup. And then also I want you to cut up your uh, paper, uh, paper uh, filter or your paper towel, I'll show you both, into uh, little strips. And it doesn't, honestly, it doesn't really matter I'm just going to separate the two sides of my coffee filter because that was probably the one you're wondering about what to do with. Um, and I'm going to just go ahead. I don't like the edges. So I'm going to get rid of those. And I don't even really mind what shape it is. It could be a triangle. I don't really mind. But I'm going to make it, you know, wide enough to actually fit in the cup or it's narrow enough to fit in the cup, but, you know, wide enough to write on. So I'm going to do that. Um, and we can probably get several out of that one coffee filter. Okay. So, and then if you don't, if you like things perfect, you know, go ahead and snip it off if you like. If you don't, it doesn't matter. Okay. Uh, oh, actually, yeah, it, you know, sometimes it's pointy too when people do it, so it doesn't matter. Okay. And then with the paper towel, same thing. I'm just going to make sure it fits in my cup. So I'm going to see that it's wide, wide enough to fit in or not too wide that it doesn't, doesn't fit in the cup. And we'll make one of those as well. Okay. All right, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to start. If you do have a ruler, this is a good time to use the ruler to draw a line. Now I can see that my water is just there, right? And I could always pour it out or whatever. So I'm going to make the line on my paper just a little bit high or higher than that to make sure that the line is not in the water to start with, okay? So it doesn't matter exactly how much, but as long as it's over the water, okay? So I'm going to use a ruler for that, but you don't have to. And that's our starting point today. Okay. So Nancy, you're saying mm -hmm. that the, the line with the pencil the should, line the, the that over, you just drew, mm -hmm. should be over the water? Over the water, that's right. Yeah. Okay. So okay. you're drawing a starting line and you're going to let the, we're going to be letting the water go over that line in a moment. Right. Okay. So that, uh, so you're drawing a line on either one, we do that. Okay. Um, and we'll talk about what this experiment is called. It's actually called chromatography, but I'll explain that a little bit more once we actually get some results. So let's see what happens first. Okay, so there's my paper. And then the next thing to do is to get the material you're testing, which is in my case, a black marker like this. And I'm going to make a line, a little line, a little dash on that starting point line. And then I think I'm going to do a brown one next to it to see, but you can just do one. It doesn't matter. 
um, I'm going to do, and then when you're putting that ink down, what you're doing is you want that ink to be uh, moving along. You want, uh, so you want to put enough of that. So I'm going to actually, without actually marking up your table, of course, but I put enough ink that there's quite a lot there. Okay. And then I'm going to do, for me, I'm going to try this pen here for the brown. And if you want to try something different than uh, black and brown, you can. And I encourage you to do more of them after this, but um, it might be more fun to do black and brown for, to start. Okay, all right, and we'll see why. Okay, so that's mine. All right, I've got my line. I've got my material that I'm testing. I'm gonna actually label because that's, those are good science skills. And then later you might not be able to see what you started out with. So I'm gonna use my pencil to say black. And then I'm going to put brown here. And the pencil will not move like the ink will move. But you can also, if you happen to have a ballpoint pen as well, you can, you could put that. It doesn't matter. Um, if you're drawing on the, the paper towel, you can do it. You just have to be careful with your pencil so you're not piercing through. But maybe that's where you're going to find, um, you know, the that I'm going to put purple on this one, for example. That's maybe where you're going to find that it's easier to use the ballpoint pen if you have a ballpoint pen. But, or you can just use your pencil carefully when you're drawing on it. Okay, so I'm going to put a lot of purple on mine. So do one, because I'm going to do two. And, okay, so if everyone's ready with that, does anyone have any questions about that? Okay. Uh, we're going, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to, and then this is where you can have your tape ready if you want. I'll show you what to do with the tape if you do have tape. You don't, it's not a big deal. But what I want to do is I want to dip the paper in the water. And what will happen is that because of the structure of the paper, the, the paper will absorb up the water. Okay, that's going to go, uh, it's going to travel up. Here, I'll get the tape. And those little spaces in the paper, in the cellulose of those paper, are gonna draw that water up. That action has a name, it's called capillary action. And I'm gonna put the, there you go. it doesn't matter where your tape is, honestly, just somewhere so it stays in there so you don't have to hold it, or you can hold it. And can you see that on mine, the water is coming out, it's a little darker than the paper up here, so that's where the water is and the water's passing over my ink. And then as it's passing over, can you see something happening? Is anything happening on yours? Mine, mine is doing something. I don't know if you expected it to do this, but we have this, uh, we've got this spreading that's happening. Now, is it all black on yours or all brown? No, it's something else, right? So you've got different colors coming out. And so that can travel up, you, you can let it go. I'll just stick in my purple one as well, put a little water here. I'll just hold mine up while- Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there we go. And Nicole has, is holding hers up. Oh, well. very nice. Yeah. Okay, and you can let that go to almost the top if you want. Okay. I had right. black and then, then brown and then I did blue. You did blue as well, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. so. Did anyone else do it out there? I hope so. Um, I'll just say I did a black one and a brown one. And when I was kind of testing some things out, I did a gray pen as well, which is very, very pastel. It has blue and yellow in it, which I didn't expect. Uh -huh, very good. OK, if you, if you want to, you can turn your video on and, and show the camera your, your chromatography. I'll show off a few more of my old ones too, just so you can see some variety. So this one I had labeled on there. Now the reason the line's also useful is if you were trying to measure and compare the distances, you can, you know, can you have the line as a starting point and you can compare that. But this one is black and brown and I've got black Crayola as well, which is kind of a dead Crayola um, marker. Okay, and so so I have a variety of them, but the paper towel works as well. See, you don't, you don't even need the coffee filters. I know that I run out of coffee filters a lot. Okay, and here's um, some things that I learned as well. One thing was that my whiteboard markers did not work, even though they don't say permanent on them and you use the, the water to wipe off the whiteboard marker. That's why the tape is useful sometimes. Um, 
then you got this didn't work at all, which was I was really surprised about. And then the other thing was that I changed the paper to a less absorbent paper. This is a sticky note here, and it didn't really help. It took for the water took forever and never really moved up um, in time. So that water, um, the paper is, is important as well. Okay, did anyone else want to show their results? Anyone out there? Okay, all right. So we'll go on to another slide. Feel free to like um, say it in the chat if yours did something. Okay. Uh, Nancy, uh, Daniel is watching from Facebook and he said, gorgeous strips. <laughs> okay, fantastic. <laughs> they, they do look very aesthetically yeah. pleasing. <laughs> so I was going to say too, like not only is it a science experiment, but it is actually a, a neat opportunity to make some science themed art. So some people have made, for example, with coffee filters with a bigger one, a round one, they made like a little butterfly. Or you can try all these different colors to see if you can predict them. So let's take a look here. I'm going to share again. And can you see that? OK. And then there is an example of what happened there. I think ours turned out even better, actually. All of ours uh, are in interesting colors. And so oh, sorry to interrupt. I was wondering if I could share something that Chloe said. About yeah, for sure. Result. Of course. She says that, uh, unfortunately, my webcam doesn't work, but my green marker had some blue color. And mm -hmm. that traveled further up the paper than the green pigment. Oh, fantastic. Excellent. Okay, awesome. So I'm going to let these dry. So we're, you know, just put them somewhere where they'll dry out. And then you should, the pencil should stay there with the, with your labels and you've got your different pigments. So what happened? Well, you can see this example here. This is where they deposited there or put down their material. Um, also, if you guys have kids in that are tuning in or watching, um, please let us know. It'd be great to hear like what ages are out there as well. If anyone is out there that, that's a kid. Okay, so we've got the, these different pigments that have separated out in layers. And this, this pigment had several of them. See, one, two, three, four, five, maybe. And here we've got the solvent front. The solvent is just another word for the liquid that's dissolving. So that's the water in this case. And then, uh, and then you can see that this is the distance that traveled up. So why is it traveling up? So the, we've got the, the water is dissolving the pigments and breaking them apart. And let's see what I have here. And they are, pigments are something that help us to see color, okay? And they're separating them out because they're, the water is dragging them along to the top. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about color first. Uh, when you're thinking about the sunlight, the sunlight to us is like a white light, right? But actually inside of it, there are all the colors of the rainbow. And you know that when you see a rainbow, right? That, that light passes through raindrops and then bends and the different types of colors actually bend in different, you know, a little bit different uh, to each other. And then you see that spectrum. You can also do that if sometimes if you have some sort of glass prism, that light going through will, will uh, spread out those different wavelengths. So in this case here, we've got a sun. We've got all those colors of light in the white light are all coming down from the sun. They're coming down to this apple and the apple is bouncing back that red color to the eyeballs here. And so what's happening with the other colors is that they are not bouncing, they're not getting reflected. They are being absorbed by the apple. So same thing, and then that, that there's a pigment, they're called anthocyanin pigments if you like the names, but, and there's a whole variety of them and they're in the skin of apples and they help, uh, they, they help us see that color. They, and so in the case of the leaf, the leaf of course is green. So what color is it going to be bouncing into your eyes, the green color, but absorbing all the other colors of the rainbow. So these pigments uh, in natural things and in ink are, have their own color. They have their own characteristic color that we see um, when light bounces off of them into our eyes. Okay. So, uh, these, so when you're making ink, you want to have you know, whatever pigments you want in there. If you've got paint, same thing, paint has pigments. Okay. So uh, just to think about uh, all of these animals looking at these colors, 
Well, some things we don't even see. Not all animals see the same colors. We as humans do see the visible light spectrum. That's why we call it the visible light spectrum that's visible to us. But it's uh, ultraviolet light. UV light is actually visible to a lot of animals, including insects and uh, you know, some, some mammals and things, right? Uh, birds. So they're going to be using that kind of wave, just like the way we, we use wave, uh, colors. So these are different radiation types. You can see the other ones around here, but kind of keep that in mind for later that, that they can see some other animals can see ultraviolet. Okay. All right, so uh, we had a whole variety of uh, pigments. Uh, we'll just talk about color a little bit more. Uh, when we're talking about something physical and light bouncing off of something, then we've got uh, something called subtractive color, but these colors uh, if you were to add up all those colors together, then you know, uh, we would get black. So your pen that you tested, if you were testing a black pen, isn't uh, a black pigment. Like the pigment itself is it's actually a combination of several pigments. And that's why you could see all those spreading out in that, in that sort of arty way. Whereas if you're thinking about light, like the sunlight we're talking about um, from the sun being white light, and is the combination of all these different colors. So we'll be, we were talking about the pigments here. Um, and when you add them up, you get black. Now, these um, are called primary colors. You know, maybe in, in school, especially, uh, I know that I learned the primary colors being blue, red, and yellow, or then blue, red, and green. green. Well, when you're talking about ink, you've got this uh, cyan, magenta, and the, the yellow here. And if you ever you know, opened up a color printer and had cartridges in there, for example, uh, those are the colors. Or if you're ever designing something for being, uh, that's gonna be printed out versus designing something that's gonna be say on a web page that you see in a screen that's um, basically light coming out, you know, you've got a difference in those colors. So in this case here, we've got this combination here, this cyan um, and this yellow mixing to be green. So uh, we had a green pen there that had uh, different colors coming out. Uh, my black had a lot of things. It had, my black had um, blue and red here. Uh, so different things combining. Now, if you were try, trying to make brown, like I did a brown marker, uh, these uh, colors can be called complementary. Okay, so let's use this here. Uh, so we've got red plus green on the other side of this color wheel. The color wheel is an, an easy way to think about color by putting the colors around like this. That would make brown. Orange and blue are opposite to each other. That would also make brown. And purple and, or violet and yellow you know, would make brown. So you can get these color combinations. And then to get those intermediate colors, you can mix the ones nearby each other too, right? So, um, so green and yellow, you get the sort of light green color, for example, right? Or yellow and red, you could mix two inks that were yellow, ink pigments that were yellow and red and get orange, okay? All right, so why, why are there so many amazing colors in nature? Can you see this rainbow lorikeet here with these bright flowers and fruit? Um, they've got kind of like a brush-like tongue and what they do is they come to flowers and eat the uh, pollen and the nectar and the fruit of different plants too. So this is an, uh, a bird that's in Australia, but look at these amazing colors. Uh, and so colors in nature can be wonderful signals to other species, you know, so maybe this is, or it's the, sorry, other individuals in the same species. Maybe this is trying to talk to, you know, to talk to uh, or signal to uh, another or attract another lorikeet, for example. So, and maybe this plant is trying to attract an animal like the lorikeet that's gonna be feeding on the nectar it uses to attract the lorikeet as well. So pigments can often be used to attract within a species. They can also attract other species. So I've just got this neat example here. Uh, in this study, we had petunias. Petunias have these beautiful flowers and there is a mutation in one location 
on their genes. Okay, we'll talk more about genes as well in a moment. I'll show you um, some pictures. Uh, but having that mutation, that change in their the instructions to tell them how to make itself, you know, the genes are the DNA, uh, for example, and that mutation has allowed the flowers to be quite different in different species of petunias here. So you can see the species names down here. So in this case, you get um, a sort of uh, pink or a fuchsia kind of flower. Uh, in this one, they have this white flower, but they have a lot of um, UV uh, uh, reflectance as well, or absorbance. Uh, and then, so that can change. And this is a moth that comes out at nighttime. So maybe colors are not so good for a moth that's in the dark, right? Uh, or bright colors like this. And then over here, you've got this red. And if you've had a hummingbird feeder, you might, ha might know already that hummingbirds love red flowers, right? So this idea is that the, the pigments, just that one change or the one, one gene, gene area uh, change may have allowed for this diversity, all these different types of pollinators. So the pollinator preference driving that plant diversity. And also there's ideas about the plant diversity driving the pollinator diversity as well, right? So let's go on to another example. So pigments, uh, the, that is a, a pigment uh, coded by a gene. And did you see this one? Okay, so I don't, oh, I've got the words off there, but this is a moth that looks like a twig, right? So this, look at this, this is actually, there's its little face, the eyes and the head, but this is sort of the back, the top of the thorax there. Um, looking like the end of a twig. Um, beautiful coloration here. So sometimes it's not about attracting, but about uh, hiding, not attracting anything uh, that might eat it. And then here, I just thought I'd throw this in there because I had a lot of trouble with this personally. Uh, where, who's there? Where, where is the uh, animal? Uh, I'll give you a hint because I wasn't 100% sure it was there, but I will say that it is there. Uh, go ahead and put that in the comments if you can, if you have any thoughts about what you see or what you think might be there. And if you want to share any comments about, you know, uh, the, uh, or questions from the slide so far. Okay, it's Nicole saying in the chat that it's a hard one and I definitely agree. Sheila has a guess. She says dark spot in upper right corner. Okay, good guess. Okay. And then I'm going to give you a clue now. Uh, the clue is that, and I got this clue and I still had trouble to be honest, so I'll, I'll admit it. Uh, it's a dead center. And I know like if, you know, you might be able to, you know, magnify in another situation but <laughs> so <laughs> oh, oh, oh very close got it yeah i saw it very good <laughs> all right so uh so you've seen this before maybe kashafa you knew the answer too or did you spot it okay I so spotted it right when chloe typed it oh fantastic okay <laughs> so here it is okay so uh if you look there i put an arrow where the eye like i think the eye is this little dot and then there's the coloration of the snake there kind of zigzagging, right? Yeah, so uh, camouflage can be really amazing, um, especially with other animals like cephalopods. I'm just gonna show this really quick video. Uh, this is a cuttlefish. Uh, cuttlefish you might know as being really great uh, camouflagers, but what they have basically in their skin are different sacks of pigments. You know, we've been talking about these pigments, chemicals that have a color uh, or you know, reflect a color and absorb others. And those sacks um, can expand and contract and, and go smaller, bigger and smaller. And so the different sacks of pigment, these little um, cell, cells, they have um, diff like each one has a different color. So they have different colored uh, sacks all over their skin and they can control them. Look, that's my favorite part. <laughs> so that is the, uh, so that's the cephalopod or the cuttlefish using that amazing mimicry to, to catch its food. So that's a great use for it and a great adaptation or a way that it helps it survive better. Okay, so, all right. So other pigments in nature, 
uh, are really, really important. All of life almost depends on pigments, really. Uh, and that's because they're used in photosynthesis. And that is what plants do, for example, when they take in the sunlight and they use that energy. They're also taking in, taking in carbon dioxide and they're taking in water in their roots, for example. Uh, and they take that and make their own food. They make their sugars. And so in order to gather the sunlight to be able to do that, they need pigments. And so in this photograph here, um, microscopic photograph, then these are plant cells. So, you know, uh, just to give you a sense of how many cells there are, I believe there's uh, 30 trillion cells in a human body, for example. So they're the little parts that make us up. And in this plant leaf, uh, this is a little tiny moss leaf. Uh, they have these little green balls in there, right? And those green balls are called chloroplasts. And they have the pigment that takes in the sunshine and they do this process. So here, this is what the inside of the chloroplast would actually have even smaller parts, little tiny discs all stacked up. And those, uh, and if you were to look closely at the, you know, the membrane or the skin of those little discs, you would have something called chlorophyll. That's the type of uh, pigment that is the most common in plants. So there's chlorophyll A, in chlorophyll B, you can see the structure here. Um, and that structure shows sort of like a ring part. That ring part is exceptionally good, very good at releasing and moving electrons. And that's what allows this to happen, right? Moving these electrons or, um, to, to have this energy transfer to do this photosynthesis. Okay. So guess what? There's not just one type of pigment in plants. Uh, and you know that because you've seen all different colors of plants too, I'm sure. Uh, and so we have the chlorophyll A and the B. And what this uh, diagram is showing you, this graph is showing you what colors it's best at absorbing and so or reflecting. So over here, this is absorbance. So this is the sort of blue colors here you can see. And so chlorophyll A is really good at that. And then you've got that sort of red color. Well, what color did chlorophyll look like to us in the last slide? Green, right? So it's not absorbing the green, it's reflecting that out. Um, so this one is chlorophyll B, it's a little bit different. Carotenoids, you might think that sounds like the word carrot and it's named after carrots. And it is what gives carrots that orangey color. So carotenoids tend to be orange and yellow and red and they absorb a different part of the spectrum and are able to pass on that energy to the, to the chlorophylls, right? Uh, there's also not just plants that have uh, the ability to photosynthesize, algae and cyanobacteria can do that too. And there's all different kinds of little microscopic algae called protists, like all those little uh, various plankton, um, many, many different kinds of plankton in the water. Uh, they have, um, a lot of them have that ability to photosynthesize. And so here we've got uh, pigments in algae that are, have a different absorbance, right? So think about this though, the, like imagine the sunlight going through air, do you think it'll go through water in a different way? And so uh, they will uh, bend in the water. And when you get deeper down, you don't get that green color, those green waves going in. The, the better waves to have are in the middle here. Okay. So different uh, environments will give you uh, different uh, wavelength types too. Okay, uh, let's see. Okay, does that make sense? Let's see what the chat says. Anything from, from the chat? Uh, so um, just there's a, there were a few comments on the camouflage. Lots of people saying it was very cool. Fantastic. Um, and then, Daniel has a comment just on black black markers because uh -huh. you use one. Um, uh -huh. He says uh, uh, different brands can produce different types of strips due to different ink recipes. Yeah, absolutely. So there's not just one way to make black. And so I think we got probably different ones just between you and I, um, what we got. Yeah, absolutely. Different combinations. Same with brown. You can get different combinations just to make brown too. Uh, yeah. And yeah, yeah, this is a really good comment. Okay. Great, so we'll go on to this. Um, so when we're thinking about how important these pigments are in leaves um, to photosynthesize for the plant, oh, let's go um, one more reason besides just making that food that a lot of different animals are going to be eating and then that, that, that energy going up the food chain. The really important thing too is that most of life on earth depends on oxygen. 
and that we get them from, we get that from photosynthesizing organisms. So really, we do depend on those pigments. Um, so here's some pigments from I believe this is like spinach. And here we've got these bands coming out. So you see they're the more the, the yellow and greens of the chlorophyll. And then on this side, if you're interested in the different names, oops, sorry. Uh, the, if you're interested in the different names, there are the different names of these pigments here. So um, yeah, okay. So, uh, and then, so if you're interested in going one step further, uh, the one thing you do need to do is if you are a kid, you do need permission from your adults and you need them to supervise you with the alcohol, the rubbing alcohol. Uh, that's also known as isopropyl alcohol. You might have some for your first aid kit, for, for example. You can use that to get the pigments to move up. So the plant pigments will not dissolve very well in the water, but they will in the rubbing alcohol. Um, so if you do that carefully, you might be able to get some of these greens and yellows as well. Um, from the plants. Okay, uh, so uh, TLC uh, is, uh, actually stands for thin layer chromatography and you can use, uh, so in labs they're using all sorts of different things. So instead of just using paper towels or coffee filters, they might be using silica gel or something called aluminum oxide or uh, other papers um, um, like other fancier filter paper that has just cellulose. So those are the kinds of things. So that, that is that base that doesn't move and stays stationary in other words. And then the solvents can be different as well. So like I said that, you know, even at home you could use the, the rubbing alcohol as an example. Okay, all right. Um, and see, is it okay if I yeah. share? Yeah, for sure. Okay, um, so I, I think this is Nicole's own comment. She's saying her brown is a pink and cyan and her Ooh. black is yellow and orange and blue and purple yeah yeah Lots of so, colors that's cool we were talking yeah. about how the blue and the orange on the color wheel make brown so that actually makes a lot of sense right if you think mm -hmm. about the color wheel um probably there's mm -hmm. yeah there's also one comment from facebook trevor says uh, uh was a fun thing to learn about when learning to scuba i think this is in reference to the water pigment appearance oh, yeah. yeah absolutely and so that changes all the way in the different depths that's interesting. Yeah, that's cool. And then, of course, it gets really dark at the bottom then. Okay, so uh, so I wanted to sort of draw a parallel with some of these other things that are really, you know, that are really affecting us right now. Uh, and we're talking about COVID-19 a lot and, uh, you know, maybe not understanding exactly what's happening with these different, with the research or the tests and things like that. But what we did is very similar in a way to the tests for COVID-19 so, uh, and, and for other genomic gene analyzing techniques. So let me just uh, show you this. This is a home uh, antibody testing kit. And the idea is behind, behind it is that if you do this at home with a little bit of your blood, you would be able to you know, have a good idea that you probably had uh, COVID-19 in the past, or sorry, the COVID-19 is the name of the disease. So that is an indicator. It's not going to be perfect. It's not going, and um, there's always an error level as well with any of the tests, but also this one is not going to be able to distinguish between our virus right now uh, that, that we, we call the disease COVID-19 and the when we, um, several years ago, when we had the SARS virus virus. So if they're in some countries, they're using these little home testing kits, and then they would have to then go to another test, like our swabbing test that we use here, they would have to do that in addition. So we've been uh, swabbing, putting a swab up our, our nose to get to these back nasal cavity area, and or in our throats to get a sample to test. So that would be necessary. So it's good to know that you know, you, it's, it's, you can't interpret everything from these little tests, but I'll show you how, how cool and how close it is to paper chromatography. So here, um, so there is this S that stands for sample. So what you do is you take a little pinprick of your, uh, of your finger so that you can get a tiny, tiny amount of blood out. And you might uh, know about people that have diabetes that have to do their sugar level uh, testing, kind of similar kind of thing. This, this also the shape of a home kit might also, well, if you're familiar with it, remind you of a pregnancy test, right? So kind of, kind of similar in a way too. And so, but you're using urine. So here 
this B stands for buffer. So when you get this home kit in those countries, uh, they, it comes with a little bit of a liquid and you put the liquid in here. That's like our solvent. Today we use the solvent of water, um, but this would be a different buffer solution. Okay, so then think about this just like our little strip of, uh, of uh, paper. The solvent would creep up over our sample, just like our ink, and then go all the way up to here. And then it'll either have one of these lines or both of these lines, and then it'll go to the top. And we stopped and we kind of pulled our paper out of our cup. But here, this is important for a home test because this is the control. That means that if there isn't a line there, maybe the liquid never went up in the first place and your test didn't even run. And that's important to know. Right. So what is this IgG and IgM? These are two different antibodies. So this can detect those, the presence of those two antibodies. They are going to indicate whether you had um, the primary antibodies, the first ones forming, or if your body formed them later. Too. So it can give you a time, uh, an indication of time as well. But it is, I thought it was really neat that this is very similar to our chromatography process, um, but just in a home kit form. Okay. Uh, over here, I'll give you a little bit more detail of what we're looking at here. Um, so I wanted to, to say what are genes? Well, genes are um, include DNA and RNA. And this shape here, you know, I've got some cat toys my cat never liked. Uh, these sort of, you've got two spirals that are joined together, right? And that is also called the double helix shape. And so basically, you know, you can take apart those two strips as well. And you have, but they are joined together, they bond together. And it looks like this. And each one of these parts that form that latter part uh, the ladder rungs, it are the nucleotides, they're called nucleotides. And there's only four of them, and they're A, T, G, and C for DNA. If we're talking about RNA, we've just got, instead of T, you've got a U, so but very similar. So the A always goes with T, and the G always goes with C. Now, you can think about these on one side as being letters that make up words, but the words here are only three letters long. They're always gonna be three letters long and that three letters codes for something special. So uh, the amino acids. So that's why, so what, when people talk about the genetic sequence of something, they're talking about this list of A, T's, G's and C's on this side, okay? Uh, and then there's the matrix side, okay. Uh, okay, so. Uh, this is again that that kind of structure, that that kind of uh, twisted ladder structure, and then on this side, the RNA just has this uracil instead, and it's showing a single strip. So in our um, the COVID nineteen virus, it's actually called uh, SARS CoV two. It's very similar in structure to the SARS virus um, that we had years ago. So that. Uh, genetic material of that virus, in not every virus, but this particular one has a single strand of RNA. Okay, uh, so that's still called the genes of that um, um, of that virus, and it's still if you had all of the genes of the virus, then you can call that a genome. Okay, so how, how is that kind of like what we did with the chromatography? Well, this is called a gel electrophoresis. So once you have a sample and then you've made many, many copies of that, of a fragment of, of the, the genetic material. So in our case, RNA we're talking about, then you can use this to separate it like we separated things with our paper. So you see there are, um, they, you can cut up your fragments into different sizes. Um, and so you can have different chemicals that will go after the A's or the T's or the G's or the C's. Uh, and then you'll have different cuts. And some will be longer, some will be shorter. And then you run, uh, you, put, you put your material in these little holes that you've made. And guess what? This is actually a gel. So it's kind of like jello jell or making a gelatin. 
And so a big part of this, this uh, technical process is actually just making the right type of jello. You know, when you have jello, you've got to have it, you know, not too soft where it doesn't um, hold up together at all. And you don't want it to be too, too hard as well because then nothing will be able to go through it. Uh, so you've got to have the right kind of jello as well. And then you need those, the, that matrix. It's kind of like, imagine if you had a mesh and you're trying to get through the mesh. And if the mesh holes are too small, maybe you wouldn't be able to get through the mesh at all. So those molecules wouldn't be able to get through. If you had a mesh with two big holes, then they would all get through and then you wouldn't have your separation. So you got, you got to have your right jello. And then you've got here um, a power source. So you're going to hook it up to electricity and put a charge on it. And the charge here, this is the, the oh, okay, so this is the, the cathode is normally the positive end. Okay, so, and the, and the anode is the other end. So you've got this DNA having its own charge. And I didn't really go into it too much, but in our paper chromatography, uh, that liquid was dragging up those molecules of pigment. And uh, it depends on how well those molecules dissolve in the pigment or in the in the water and how well they pull up as well okay so how they how how sticky they are to the charges so how, how the different polarity is another way of saying that so in this case you know imagine you have this like mesh you're trying to get through and imagine that you've got big ones and little ones big big fragments with lots of different um, base pairs, nucleotides uh, lined up, and then you got short ones. Which one is going to be easier to drag up? It's going to be those little ones, and the longer ones are going to stay down lower. So here we've got the longer molecules down here and the shorter ones there. Okay. All right, so this is, and you know, they tag it with a, um, a UV dye, so it'll glow under UV. And so this is actually a photograph of a gel. And this is, you know, these are called bands. And then you would be able to read them because you have a ladder here, which is your known quantities and, and how long those, you know that this one, for example, might be a hundred nucleotide base pairs. This might, you know, like whatever it is, this is like 200. And so, you know, the material that you're putting down here has those certain numbers and you can compare with this. Okay. So uh, here is an example. Um, you know, don't worry about it too much. I know there's, there's a lot in here, but just if you're interested, here is, you know, imagine that the, all these fragments have been cut up into different sizes, so different sizes, and you're drawing them through your gel, and you've got the small ones reaching all the way to the end, and guess what? You can actually see that, you know, you've, made, you've used different materials so they'd cut at these different nucleotides. So this cut at all the Gs. So then you can see where the Gs were in your sequence. So to put down your sequence, and I wish this has actually been written in the reverse, but for example, the G is the smallest one. So that's the first one. And then the uh, A, oops, sorry. And the A is here and then the C. So that's the next one because it's the next highest up. And then you've got this one. It's a T is the next highest up. And then you've got that sequence, you can figure that out. So up until the 80s, people were looking at actual gels like that and you know, manually reading them like that. And that's how they figured out the sequence. Uh, I'm just gonna show you, uh, don't worry about all the detail, but I just wanted to show you that today we've got you know, these machines, there's a big box and they're not just running one at a time. Each of these is a, th uh, a capillary, it's called. And we're talking about capillary action is how it pulls up, you know, the liquid pulls up in a very fine tube, uh, like the way it pulled up our paper towel. And this, um, this, these are those tubes. And so there's many, many of these inside the machines running them simultaneously. Uh, the computer uh, can also, you know, sort them for you. And so there's not that manual, uh, you know, reading anymore and that they can work much, much faster. That's how we've been able to, you know, sequence or find out the, the code for the entire human genome. Okay. So uh, uh, there are different kinds of sequencers. So I just, I thought this was cool because this is the first person who ever did DNA analysis or DNA sequencing in space. 
so she's an astronaut. Uh, over here, we've got um, a modern type of very, very fast uh, sequencer. And then here we have this uh, handheld one. You know, maybe you can go into the field and sequence uh, something outside as well. So that's the developing technology. Okay. So what can we do with all this information? Why do we want to find out these sequences? Uh, so one thing is, I'll just quickly show you this because it's kind of fun. I discovered this. I didn't. I didn't know about this. Uh, how cool the website was until recently. Uh, this is showing you the tree of life with very, very current information, and it's going to show you uh, a tree of life that's built on the the uh, organisms that we have all of the genetic information for. So all the whole genome has been sequenced. And so here, and also the way they've they've kind of tagged everything is kind of cool. So you can if you go up here. Um, you can see this is Giardia, this one here. Oh, where is it? There it is. Um, I don't know if that's Sasha Baron Cohen, but uh, for some reason he's representing all of humankind. Uh, so that's Homo sapiens. And you know, you can see these relationships of how we think things are related to each other based on having analyzed and compared all those DNA sequences. So that's one thing you can do. Something that um, the museum is very interested in, and we talk about a lot, is understanding how how life evolved and changed, and and how things are related to each other. And a lot of that work is from that genetic uh, genetic uh, information. Okay, so I lost my. Okay, let me see. So maybe while I'm getting back to my page here, uh, Kasha, do you have any comments or questions that you can share? Okay. Yeah. Um, so Nicole shared the link, uh, like a clickable version of the link to the Tree of Life. Oh, so people can fantastic. Look at that. Um, and then Nicole is uh, asking, uh, I think this might be a bit of a joke, maybe. I wonder if you could make yeah. a chromatography jello dessert. Yeah, I was thinking about that. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I think that's great. I was thinking like maybe you can even do a home, like if you really worked at it for a long time and like, you know, did trial and error, maybe you could do some sort of chromatography. Uh, like, yeah, yeah, like actually have something pass through. But, uh, you know, if you had the, you know, if you, you had to hook up the charge maybe to get the, the, the electricity going through. Um, right. Yeah, that's really fun. Um, okay. Uh, so, this is, and then this, I just want, thought I'd show this. This is a, a beautiful image, but it's from the Tree of Life web project. And also another really interesting way to learn about how things, um, as far as we know today, uh, or maybe for this one a few years ago, uh, how things are related to, to each other and how they may have changed over time. Yeah. Okay, so just, uh, we talked about it already, but RNA is the genetic material, not DNA, and the SARS-CoV-2 -CoV virus. So this is just a picture of it. So you've probably seen images where they show the outside and all these little proteins sticking out, um, but also the inside, this is like a, a depiction of the RNA being coated with other proteins as well. So the actual RNA would be this red part here that's going through the middle. Okay, um, so, so, this being able to get that sequence that is incredibly important to all sorts of different kinds of research, um, including, you know, uh, pathology and epidemiology and uh, research. And so, uh, in the this, you know, as you know, the the, the COVID nineteen is only really, um, as far as we know, started in in November. And in that time to now, you know, just these six months, there's an incredible amount of research that is happening. Uh, the, uh, in response to it. And the first genome uh, sequence was announced in uh, January 9th to 12th. And uh, it was um, also identified as the agent responsible because at first they only knew that it was a pneumonia-like disease. And so they had to figure out what was causing it. Uh, and I just uh, wanted to give a shout out to the microbiologists out there because um, and uh, other microbiologists all say this, that this was a really significant, you know, point in that history uh, where uh, Yang Zhen Zhang, sorry about the pronunciation, from the Shanghai uh, Public Health Clinical Center and School of Public Health actually shared that in an open access way. So that was a really critical um, moment. And that sequence allows, a, allows researchers to do a lot of different things. So, um, 
uh, the, for example, and this is just a sort of a diagram depicting the idea of the RNA strand. And so it is one strand instead of two, uh, like, a, like we are two stranded the DNA, but this, the, this virus is single stranded RNA. And you've got these different areas that they know about uh, how they code these different um, proteins of the, the virus. So it really is important. And even knowing, the, even knowing that genome is what you need in the first place to be able to do diagnostic tests, to do swab tests, to be able to look for a fragment to confirm that someone has the, the disease. So that, that's, um, so that started it all and there's still lots going on. Uh, this isn't, you know, there's a lot of information here to ignore it. Uh, you can, you can sort of, but I just wanted to point out that, you know, the idea of what happens with the virus. So this whole white part is meant to be a one human cell, you know, out of the trillions that we have in our body. And then it's showing these little viruses coming in, having to attach, and then the genetic material coming in, and then using the, the parts of the human cell to be able to make more of themselves and then send them out. So just to give you a kind of idea that it's using, there's parts called ribosomes in our cells. It has to take over those ribosomes or use those ribosomes to be able to make more of itself. So there's a lot of different ideas about how to research different treatments or prevention uh, of this disease, um, depending on like the entry and all these other things. Uh, so another way that uh, research can use these sequences is that they may be looking at different strains. If this virus um, mutates, then it could be changing over time and you can tell different things from, from that. And so maybe there might be more strain or some could infect faster or some could be even uh, better uh, for uh, antiviral treatments. Um, and then just, uh, I found this, uh, uh, I've known about this, but it took me a while to really look into it. There's actually a lot of projects listed, uh, you know, in the UBC website here now, uh, and more coming in. And uh, just I picked out one that involved learning about those uh, sequences, right? The, the biogenetic analysis or genomic work. And so this particular researcher is studying how uh, the virus uh, evolves, how. Um, how it might be uh, being select, selected for uh, increased virulence or, or you know, infection and um, immune evasion and looking at other viruses from other animals uh, and to compare them and look at, and look at that virulence or host switching and human to human uh, transmission. So there's a lot going on and the, you know, the, the essentially now that we've talked about it, hopefully that you can kind of relate to the, the process of that, you know, separating out of, out of those parts out to learn what's inside. Yeah, okay. So uh, I don't know. Oh, we're not doing too bad on time. I kind of expected it to go to, to be a longer one today. Does anyone have any questions uh, that you could ask? And, um, and feel free also to share your results as well. So Nancy, no questions in the chat, but I will give a little update of my strip. OK, awesome. Uh, the colors have gone really high up. This was the brown, and this was the blue. Oh, awesome. Yeah, my black was, didn't, there's a little bit of pink, but not too much. So, but I might try another black just to see if it, like later on, to see if there's a difference. That's awesome. Oh, and I should have said, I forgot to say that while I was talking, you could also try more examples and more colors too. And, uh, you know, if you're really into it, try the, the plant uh, leaf thing later too, if you like, and, or make some art instead. Um, Nancy, I'll just share mine as well. So mm -hmm. this was my brown one, which is yeah. very brown, pink, and cyan. And this okay. was the black one, which I think looks like a forest fire. Like it's quite wow. Funny. That's oh, like that is really art. nice. Yeah. And I gorgeous. tried some. Yeah, I tried some colors that I thought would be multiple pigments, but these three are not, which kind of surprised me. I thought that they would be a combination of colors. What colors were they to start with? Um, they were exactly this color. So oh, yeah. Um, yeah. purple, navy, and cyan. Oh, the purple was a cyan. Oh, interesting. Okay, I wasn't expecting yeah. the purple one here. So Nancy, there is a question from today. Sheila. Mm -hmm. um, any ideas of studies regard uh, that 
talk about transfer of viruses from cats to people and vice versa. Oh, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't hear anything more about that. Uh, yeah. So, I, I, yeah. Anybody else that heard more about that? I know that they were looking into it, but and dogs too, right? But yeah, I didn't think it was. I think that would have made the news if you could get it from like from your cat moving around. I know that I had uh, some friends that were trying to be careful not to let their cat roam around too much and get touched by other people. But I don't know that the cat would have. I don't. Okay. So what I think is, I don't think so. But you know, I'd be wrong. That sounds right. Yeah. yeah. But um, Risa on Facebook is saying thank you. That was very interesting. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Hey, Nancy. Um, Sheila is also. I'm just going to unmute Sheila because I think she had a question she wanted to ask oh. out loud. Yeah, you can unmute everybody if you want. Like, yeah. You know, yes. Or let them unmute themselves. Hi. Hi, Sheila. <laughs> No, I've been, uh, if I can uh, talk for a second, um, curious about the cat and dog thing, because, uh, you know, presumably the virus jumped from pangolin or bat or whatever wildlife to humans. And then there was some Maybe. thought. Yeah, I mean, I think that's still open, isn't it? Yeah. For, for discussion. But then there were comments about, oh, uh, we can transfer it to animals like pets. And then I heard, well, no, humans can get it from the pets. <laughs> so it's still a little bit uh, foggy, I guess, as to the potential of that transfer um, here. I mean, you know, sort of locally, I guess I could say the discussion has been, I've been hearing about it. Uh, but if it, in fact, originated from animals and hopped onto humans, you know, it kind of still leaves that open, doesn't it? If, if pets, for example, somehow picked it up, whether or not it could get transferred to us. So I think what you're saying, what you're wondering more about is whether they can actually transmit and not just like the idea of like, you know, how we can get it from surfaces, like the cat's fur could act like a surface. Yes. Uh, that we could touch it, but you want to, you want to know if it could actually be a host, right? Uh, yeah, and that's something we can look into. But uh, I do remember my like this is not like obviously this is not an actual resource or, or a, a reference or anything. But my friend who's a doctor did mention that the cats wouldn't, but I don't know the background behind it. So I, I really do feel like we would have heard it like for sure if they had confirmed it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That anyway, the one just, I read. Yeah, yeah it's, it's interesting just, though. Right, but I mean, uh, it makes people like myself when I'm walking and see uh -huh. dogs and I want to pat all the dogs and I'm standing there going, oh no, I can't touch you. <laughs> yeah, one thing is that uh, home, uh, dog owners are not letting their dogs uh, mix with other dogs anymore. I've seen, I oh. kind of feel like when I'm walking around, they're, they're not really letting, not that that's, not that that's justified. I'm just saying, I feel like the, that some people are just keeping their dogs away from other people more. And again, that might be the surface thing, not the actual right. host, host scent transmission, but that's the touching. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, Nicole has jumped in uh, just in the chat saying that um, there's a lot of uncertainty on animal, human, animal transmission, but coronavirus, coronaviruses as a whole have a lot of, have the, that potential. Um, but surfaces are definitely the bigger issue. Yeah. 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 Good anyway, I will say I did like just the, some of the uh, images there that you had used in terms of distinguishing between the DNA and the RNA and, and that comparison with the, the COVID, um, the way that it can, that, that um, very um, inexpensive. Um, oh, the antibody test? Yeah, the antibody uh, test. Yeah. 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 Because uh, that that was a really interesting comparison. I didn't realize that it, that it would be acting in a similar way to uh, how the chromatography works, but it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, you just analogously, like just yeah. in terms of like the solvent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I did. I did just want to say it is two o five. Yeah. So, um, and Nancy, if there is anything last you want to share, and then I'll conclude. Oh, no, okay. I, yeah, please do conclude. Yeah, I think that's great. Thank you for asking, by the way, Sheila.
Oh, yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Awesome. So there's no further Great. questions from Facebook. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us. Thank you, Nancy, for leading us through an activity and that wonderful talk. I learned a lot. Um, and I just wanted to let everyone know we, we have the BD at Home sessions every week on Thursday at 1 p.m. or on Wednesday at 1 p.m. But next week is Canada Day, so of course we won't be having a session. But on July 8th, the week after, we will have a session with uh, Dr. Wayne Madison, who studies jumping spiders, and he's the head of the entomological collection at, at our museum. Um, so I encourage you to join us for that. Um, but other than that, thank you very much for all your questions. Thank you for joining us, and have a good rest of your day. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. We can go off live. Yeah.